morning. 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 I want to. <laughs> Good morning. I want to start the talk off with a, a, a brief retrospective to kind of think back a couple decades ago, just to stroll down memory lane. In 2001, <clears throat> I remember sitting in my office. I had uh, I was preparing for a conference call with a developer. We were making a golf game for the original Xbox, and it, it was an extreme golf game. Um, the developer was in Salt Lake, and we were, we were still new. We didn't know what we were doing. And we had a pretty brief exchange. Uh, and I remember this phone call uh, pretty, pretty clearly, so I wanted to share it <clears throat> with you. Hi, I'm, I'm Randy. What, what's the target profile for this game? Right? As any good user testing, user research person would do. Uh, and I get a, who the, who the hell are you? <laughs> Well, I, I'm user testing. I'm here to measure design intent. Very excited, by the way. Um, <clears throat> how many million seller games have you made, bleephole? <laughs> let's move on. Let's, let's just move on. 2003. 2003 was, a, was an interesting year because it was the first year that we had published um, our first games book chapter in an HCI uh, handbook. And at the time, HCI the community didn't really think of games as a legitimate form of human-computer interaction. So we were trying to kind of bring some of the learnings that we were doing in, in games user research to that community. Um, <clears throat> so I went to the Kai conference that year, peddling my academic wares, and I met this gentleman, Jacob Nielsen, who's a very nice person, by the way. Uh, and I was in a workshop with him, and we started to talk about um, the, the, the viewpoints that we were developing, the differences between productivity apps and, and games. And he was sufficiently impressed, for some odd reason, with what I had to say, that he invited me to be part of the prestigious Nielsen Norman Group uh, user experience conferences that were coming up in Chicago and London the following year. Uh, for me, I was been in the industry less than three years. Uh, this was a very exciting time. So I went ahead, rolled with it, we had pr pretty good attendance, I thought, and I thought the feedback from the session was good. It's like, yeah, we've got something going on here, right? The, and look closely in his eyes, because what happens next was, was nothing. Uh, I wasn't asked back for the next <coughs> uh, rounds, even though the rest of the speakers were. Um, and I don't think I spoke with Jacob for another, like, 10 years after that. But that's fine. That's fine. 2007, <coughs> 2007 was a really important year for gaming. Um, for myself, my team, and where's John Hobson, one of the best researchers that I know, I wouldn't tell him that privately, by the way, I'll just say it in front of 100 people. Um, <clears throat> Chris Moreno, another researcher who was on my team, we were working really hard for the launch of Halo 3. Now, what was interesting about this is there was a lot of PR and marketing press that was going on, and <clears throat> the time, Wired Magazine had decided to do a feature article in uh, preparation for the launch of, of the title. And so they came out, they interviewed a bunch of people at Bungie, they interviewed a bunch of people at Microsoft, and no one actually knew, including the PR team, what the story was that, that they were going to print. They created three separate stories, went back to their editor, and then they were going to decide which one to, to launch with. And when it hit the shelves, it was this. And some of you may have seen this before. Halo 3, how Microsoft Labs invented a new science of play. And the article starts like this. <clears throat> Sitting in an office chair, and frowning slightly, Randy Pagulayan peers through a one-way mirror. I'm always frowning, by the way. The scene on the other side looks like the game room in a typical suburban house. And it goes on to describe what is standard issue for most people here, which is just a usability lab. Uh, this was really cool. But what's more monumentous about this is th this is the first time that games are being compared to blockbuster movies. The first time games have arrived for mass market appeal and is being accepted as a cultural uh, kind of form of art. And what's even wackier to think, if you go back to the 2001 era, that Wired decided to tell this story through a games user research lens. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't the last time that they did this. Well, it was the last time Wired had a game cover, and there's interesting stories behind that that I, I'll share later. But, um, the fact that games user research was becoming an interesting story to tell for the launch of new titles started here. With Halo 4, Eric Shu, a colleague, a friend of mine, with Halo 4, there was a Polygon article, and again, it was focused on the games user research aspect of game development, which is, which is great, which is great for all of us in here. And there's many more examples like that as well. <clears throat> but in 2014, Fran, Fran Reyes isn't here, is she? She's not here this year? 2014, 
OXM decides to do a feature article on us. And what's interesting about this is it wasn't in the context of the launch of a game. It wasn't in the context of a launch of a piece of hardware or a brand new platform feature. There's some hardcore science happening behind the scenes at Microsoft. Armed with over a dozen PhDs, the Studios User Research Organization has been getting into gamers' heads for nearly 15 years. Now, you should look at this and replace Microsoft, replace Studios User Research Organization, and you can see yourselves in here. The fact that games user research as a discipline was interesting enough to tell, uh, to feature in, in a gaming magazine that's from mass media means we've arrived. <clears throat> so by the end of 2018, Microsoft decides to invest in seven new studios. The Initiative, Undead Labs, Playground Games, Ninja Theory, Compulsion Games, which we'll hear a talk about a little bit later, which should be cool, so you should go check that out. Um, and Exile Entertainment and Obsidian. Now, the fact that Microsoft decided to make a big investment in its first-party studios isn't the point. The point is, what we hear internally um, within the company is that user research is the number one thing that the new studios are requesting from Microsoft. And Microsoft is one of the largest software companies in the world. And you have a bunch of independent studios that can pretty much ask for whatever they want. And they're asking for user research, games user research. So when I think back in my brief little retrospective um, a couple decades ago, it really, we did start with a lot of exploration. Who are we? What are we trying to do? But exploration and a lot of rejection. I think a lot of you who were on this journey back in the days would, would experience that. But then we had awareness. Right? We had a lot of chapters that people were writing, we had a lot of books, we had a lot of presentations at GDC, Gamma Sutra articles, and so on. And so awareness of what we do in the academic communities as well as the game development communities is starting to take hold in addition to mass market awareness. With awareness comes legitimacy. It's not a weird thing anymore to say, I'm going to get an advanced degree and then go have a career in video games. At one time, that was the most bizarre thing that anyone has ever heard, but not anymore. Which brings us to where we are now, where we are relevant, we are influential, and it's something that I don't know if we truly, as, as a, a discipline, have, have really embraced. So in the beginning, we had a quest. The quest was to create a new discipline, and the quest was <clears throat> to change an industry. And I'm happy to say, a couple decades later, that we've done it with a lot of you here and a lot of you watching on the live streams. We have created a discipline, and we have changed an industry, and we should feel good about that. This is Phil Spencer. He's the executive vice president of gaming at Microsoft, and he gave a talk last year at the DICE conference, and if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend that you watch it. But there's a quote from that talk that I wanted to share with you that resonated with me quite a bit. And it's, we all know that gaming sits at the intersection of art and science, but world building, world building is magic. Now, the first part of the <clears throat> quote is pretty straightforward. Um, we often talk about games user research as a combination of art and science. At least I do. I know I've heard a lot of my colleagues uh, use the same kind of term. But it's the second one, it's the, the world building. The world building is magic that I think we really should uh, kind of hone in on. The world building ma is magic part for me. I extend it to be more around gaming experiences are magic. And it's not magic because of the art and the science and all the tech that goes on behind all the over-educated people trying to do fancy things behind the scenes to create uh, these experiences. It's magic because what it does for us as people, not gamers, but as people. And what I mean by that let me give you an example. About a year after, I think it was about a year after we launched Halo 3, I had the opportunity to host um, a lab tour for a young gentleman named Brandon. And he and his family were flying out from the Midwest. He wanted to meet some of the creators of, of the Halo universe. Now, his trip was sponsored by an organization called the Rainbow Connection. And the Rainbow Connection, it's a charity dedicated to making the dreams come true for children with life-threatening medical illnesses. And so think about that for a second. Brandon's dream was to meet the creators of Halo. And so when I talk about magic, when I talk about gaming experiences or magic, 
recognize it's a magic that's so important that it's at the heart of someone's dying wish. That is the kind of magic that I'm talking about. So when I think about who we are today and what it is that we do, right? what is games user research? There's a lot of, um, of the same challenges that we were grappling with decades ago, and a lot of them are still relevant. But it also feels like there's a missed opportunity to change the conversation a little bit, to change the dialogue. I look at a lot of the conversations that we have, the books that we're writing now, the chapters that we're writing now, the websites that we have, the, the presentations that we have, and we see a lot of the same things. We talk about playtesting, <clears throat> right? We talk about design intent. We talk about questionnaires and surveys and usability, right methods, focus groups, and all that good stuff. We talk about um, the debate between user testing and user experience, which I think is a silly debate, just for the record. We talk about instrumentation and tel telemetry, new methods like narrative, which you can learn about later. Some folks I know are br have branched out into biometrics, and GSR, and eye tracking, and all that good stuff. We talk about initial experience, and we break down the experience into things like um, core mechanics, feedback loops, and so on. We talk about the different phases of the production schedule. All of this kind of stuff is familiar. It's our bread and butter. It's our foundation. But it feels like this is all we talk about. When I step back and I think about games user research, there's three things that I see that I want you to embrace as well. And the first one is this. One, we are influential in gaming. We don't need to spend all of our time figuring out this tweaky method versus that tweaky method. We have arrived. We are influential. The second thing I want to say is we can enable important magical experiences for millions of more people. Not everyone is experiencing the magic like Brandon was. There is a large gap. And thirdly, we have an accountability. And I mean it when I say an accountability to the equity and fulfillment of those magical experiences for as many people as possible. This is the conversation that we should be having now. So, when I think back to our original quest, we should celebrate this. It was a whole lot of what we do. It was a whole lot of how we do it. We created a discipline and we changed an industry. But now we need to move forward to the why. Why do we do this? And we do it because of this, to enable the magic of gaming for every person on the planet. This is our new quest moving forward. Um, how am I doing? I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, what I wanted to do also was to kind of share, because I somehow managed to survive two decades of being called a bleep hole through, uh, in my career, I wanted to share four uh, insights that I've developed or things that I've learned over the two decades <clears throat> and show you how I've used these insights into um, how I kind of manage my team, how I look at the different opportunities that are out there, how I think about up-leveling um, and having more impact for, uh, for us all. This is a framework that I developed back at Microsoft that we called the Research Virtuous Cycle, but honestly, that's a much less interesting name. Um, when I was walking through my friend and colleague, Debbie Henderson, um, she kind of referred to it as like, Randy, that's kind of your thought iteration cycle, and, and she's absolutely right. So let me walk you through what this looks like, and hopefully it'll make, it'll make some sense for you. So the first uh, learning that I have developed over the years, and it's pretty simple, is this. Research insight increases value when more people can use it without you. Okay? It's not rocket science. And what I'm going to present next is a list of research-related activities that hopefully will illustrate what I mean by this. <clears throat> At the core of what we do, we conduct research. And that's fine. That's great. It's the core of what we do. But what comes after that is the ability to take the research that, and the insights that come out of it and contribute it somewhere. If you conduct research and you keep it in within the walls of your own report, it's not very useful. Then we go to reuse. The insights that were generated from that original piece of work, if it gets reused, it increases value over time. Okay? Then we get to a level of curation and synthesis. Think best practices, right? This isn't over.
strategic or anything. The fact that you can take the time to, to look across, do a meta-analysis, glean best practices, insights, the research and insights, the value of what came from that original piece is gaining even more momentum because it has a better chance of being applied in different places. And then ultimately, I think, from a research standpoint, we want to strive toward what I call knowledge work tools. And what this is, your ability to take the research-driven insights and create a structured approach of applying it in a way to whatever it is that you're working on without having to have the domain expertise. Think heuristic evaluation, formal heuristic evaluations, or tenets and traps. Or there was one presented yesterday that looked really, really cool from the GA Conf about accessibility. A ton of research was done that was put together into a structured format that someone can, can deploy. That's what I mean by knowledge work tools. OK, three more. Activation. Game design impact is necessary, but not sufficient. For many, 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 many years, we always defined ourselves as um, the partner to game design. We realized design intent, but it's not enough. <clears throat> we start at a UI level. We have impact there. It's foundational. It's important. We focus on core mechanics. Again, foundational and, and critical right, to the player experience. But we have, there's opportunities that have broader impact at a game level or a platform feature level. There's opportunities for impact in stakeholders who own multiple games. Excuse me, how do you take the work that you're doing and have it be relevant across more than just one experience? Some of you may be working at a franchise or horizontal level. Think of who your stakeholders are. Um, are they the ones that own the entire franchise or the horizontal? And finally, there's opportunities for games user researchers to have impact at a business level or across business level. Not just game design, but the entire business. Measurement. This one's, this one's my favorite, probably because we have debates internally about it all the time. Measurement. Measurement is action. We shouldn't fear measurement. We shouldn't fear KPIs. We shouldn't fear anything like that. Okay? At, at the root level, simply stating that I have conducted research. I have created a, a research report. I have created six research reports. They may tell you, well, that's not good enough. You've got to have impact. But there is a step where just recognizing that you have conducted research and you track that is an important thing to measure. Because if you go back to my research uh, insight from earlier, what that is is opportunities for value. So don't minimize the fact that, yes, we do research, and it's important. But even more importantly is an inform and engage step. If you're not really, really in tune with the stakeholders, the research that you're conducting could be the wrong thing. If you're not really, really in tune with your stakeholders, the research you could do may not be listened to. So the value of that research output and tracking how well you're doing is going to fall flat. We should be explicit. <clears throat> in assessing where we are in terms of inform and engage. How well are you communicating with the stakeholders? Are they the right stakeholders? Do you really understand what they need? And that is something that you can quantify. Yes, I've had, I often will look at my inbox and say, who am I interacting with? And if it's just my team, I kind of step back and say, okay, I'm not, I'm not working at the right level. I need to be partnering and making sure I'm talking with the stakeholders that I'm supposed to be talking with. This one is straightforward, right? We conduct research, we enable people to make smarter decisions. They do something with it, okay? But notice, that's the third tier. Then there's customer impact. This is what we assume. You conduct a usability test. We don't need to quantify, you know, the fact that um, you found a SEV1 error with just one participant. It's fine. We know that it's going to have positive impact. But can you go even further? and really measure what the impact is of the changes that you've made. And this is hard stuff, by the way. This, is, this can't be solved just like, just like that. And then finally, the thing to strive for for us, can we tie the research that we are doing against the business KPIs, whether it's revenue, <coughs> subscriptions, uh, monthly active users, ARPU, DARPU, or whatever it is that the business um, measures their success against. If you don't know what that is, find out. If you have no idea how you contribute to it, it's perfectly OK. But find out, how is your business measuring their success? 
And at some point, you should be pushing yourself to figure out if you are impacting that bottom line or not. The last uh, insight that I'll share learning is around integration. And its process is the enemy of noise. We live in a world of a ton of noise, and I like process. Um, when you think about your engagement with your design partners or your producers or whoever they may be, you probably have experienced what I call the reactive response. So-and-so throws something at you at the last minute and wasn't planned for and says, hey, can you run a research study on X, Y, and Z really quick? Okay, you weren't expecting it. It came out of nowhere, and it is a reactive response. It's not a bad thing, but it happens. Next level up, we kind of get to know our partners, we anticipate a little more. They may not be asking for it, for the research study, but you can get ahead and you can do that proactive one-off to just give them the stuff they need before they ask for it. It's great. <clears throat> then we get to process inclusion, right? This is a much more uh, mature approach where just partner and find out what is the development process and can you get UX or UR related milestones integrated into the development schedule. Okay? But often it may not be optimal. They may say, okay, I'll throw in a, a playtesting milestone with no time for iteration. Right? So can you get to the point where you are influencing the process to get your work placed optimally in, in the schedule so there's enough time to do something about it? And in some bizarro world, a games user research person will own and define what that process is. Okay. <clears throat> this is the four learnings that I wanted to share with you over, that I've developed over the uh, decade. Damn you, Google Slides. <laughs> um, I checked that like 50 times. I even downloaded, because I author in PowerPoint, I even downloaded the Roboto font and worked at it to make sure that weird stuff like that just happened. Anyway, so here's the four. These are the four insights. These are the four activities that kind of highlight what those insights look like. What I want to do now is kind of add meaning to it and structure to it. And again, it is akin to kind of my thought iteration process for how I see the world. Okay, research, activation, measurement, and integration. Let me add a little bit of, of narrative behind this. <clears throat> it's very simple. Research yields knowledge. You take that knowledge and you activate it to some action. From that action, you do some measurement to figure out what was the impact of that action. You learn something and you integrate it into your next move, into your, the planning phase, okay? This is not overly complicated. And then you rinse and repeat. So let me walk you through a very basic example of how this works and how we can try and push ourselves to get better when we go around the circle. Um, hey, researcher, I have a new matchmaking UI. Can you run a quick test? Um, Debbie and I were talking about this before, and she said this is kind of akin to a mentoring session. So I, unfortunately, I won't be in the speed mentoring session, but if I were, imagine this is the kind of conversation that I would have with you if this is the area of work that you're working on. Okay, you get the request. It's a reactive response thing. It wasn't planned, but you want to be a good partner. So you're off to the races. You're going to run the study. You're going to double book your participants. You're going to pay a lot of money in gratuity. Your management is going to go, what the? All right, fine, do it because you want to be a good partner. And you get knowledge out of it. You get learnings and you have good results. It's great. You then move to the activation phase and you go back to the designing partner and say, hey, can we make the changes? And they're like, ooh, thanks, no, sorry, there's, there's no time in the schedule. It, great results, but there's no time. And this is, we, we experience this all the time, right? But maybe there's an opportunity for a DLC to make the change. Maybe there's an opportunity for a content update, okay? So let's take another round. From a measurement standpoint, we have a research output, and that is a good thing. We also are en engaged with our partners. We, we're in pretty much in sync. The only issue was the timing, right? So from an integration standpoint, let's take a look at the calendar and look for the next opportunity to have that impact. For what is the DLC um, schedule or content update schedule look like? And let's just get it in a proactive one-off ahead of time 
so you don't have to worry about this timing issue. From up here, let's not run the same research again. You've already created the knowledge. Let's just reuse it. You're saving time. And in a perfect world, you get it to them in time. You activate it. And voila, there you go. You got the changes in for the next time around. Right? But are we done? We're not done. right? Where we start to push ourselves in, in the thought experiment is to go in each one of these um, quadrants and say, what would it look like if I pushed myself to get to the highest level? What does integration look like in this scenario? Right? Instead of a proactive one-off, why don't we just build a UX deliverable in the development cycle that's optimal for when we can do this the next time? Instead of just reusing the study, can we take the time to do curation and synthesis and analysis across a wealth of knowledge that's out there, get it into the ethos of our partners, so by the time they get us that first draft of what that UI is, all the silly mistakes are already, already gone because you've already infused the knowledge and, and that you get from the curation and the synthesis. From an activation piece, this is hard, right? But can you push yourself to think of scenarios where <clears throat> the impact that you're having on that UI or that mechanic can apply across the game? Are there widgets that you found usability errors to that show up in other parts of the game? Are there other games that your company may be working on if you're at a publisher or if you have a larger studio where you can just say, hey, if you have a matchmaking lobby, we've already solved this, so just take it. I mean, you can think of accessibility as a, as a great example. If you can solve how to do uh, particular accessibility features, um, not just from a functional standpoint, but from a usable standpoint, you can drop that in across any title. And all of a sudden, the area you were working on that was very focused is having impact across multiple games. From a measurement standpoint, yes, you, you should feel good that you got them to make a change, but what does it look like for customer impact? This is where we have to get out of our comfort zone and start talking to other organizations that may have access to this kind of information. What about the customer support team? They have to field expensive phone calls or they have to be monitoring um, <clears throat> complaints or people searching for help. Is there anything in there that they've been monitoring related to matchmaking lobby issues that you can do a pre-post analysis on? Or from a business impact, can you find the BI people, the, the data science people that are tracking engagement? And can you look, I guarantee you, they are looking at churn analysis, they're looking at the decay curves, they're looking at where people are falling off. Is there a chance that when they release that DLC with the new matchmaking UI, that they are actually seeing a slower decay or they're seeing less of a fall off? Maybe, maybe not, but we have to push ourselves to go and, and say, well, what would this look like? So all up, it is kind of um, a thought iteration cycle that I would use uh, to kind of help me think through a problem space to kind of level up my thinking. The thing that's nice about it as well is that it, it works for anybody, I think, in the industry. Right in, in our discipline. It works from the junior level that I just described, but I, can, I will share with you kind of um, how I'm using it to solve a problem that I have right now. So for you senior managers, your director levels and above, I think this works too. So let me do a little context setting. I never introduced myself, by the way. I am Randy. <laughs> I am the, <laughs> the director of Xbox Research, and my team is accountable for gaming at Microsoft. This isn't an org chart. It's hard to kind of, what is gaming at Microsoft? But just to give you some kind of visual, my team, we're responsible for Xbox Game Studios, which is our first party. We have 12 studios plus our publishing organization. We're responsible for the research support for our console and PC experiences, Xbox One, Windows, and so on. Um, we are responsible for the research for our Xbox Live service and all the experiences they are building, uh, Xbox Game Pass organization, the Mixer team, which is our broadcast platform. We're responsible for our gaming cloud uh, efforts, which is Project X Cloud and PlayFab. We support our Xbox business and engineering team, which focuses on transactions, monetizations, and emerging strategies. We focus on um, a horizontal org, which is called XPS. They look at things like privacy, accessibility, 
uh, safety and security, as well as our Gaming for Everyone initiative for the, for the company. So the, the scope that we have is pretty wide. Right? The surface area is pretty large of what we need to do. So with that context, how do I use this in my everyday? I had a, a few, several months ago, maybe it was six months ago, um, I had a request thrown at me from the, the gaming LT to solve for the voice of the customer. And that was literally it. That was the, <laughs> the request that was sent to me. As you get higher up, the questions that you get asked get more vague and ambiguous. Um, so what am I supposed to do with something like solve for the voice of the customer, right? And, and I st kind of start here. This is a, a reactive response kind of scenario. There is no process here. There is no anything. They're asking me, and I wasn't planning on doing this. I have things I'm working on, uh, and I need to solve this, right? So I move, and my brain goes up into a research phase, and it's like, well, this isn't about conducting new research. This is about recognizing that we're not the only ones. Our surface area is quite large, but you have other teams that would say they represent voice of the customer as well, whether it's your data science teams across that ginormous organization, the market research teams, you have teams that are purchasing syndicated research in different pockets. Nobody knows what's going on in my left, my arm, right arm. Um, and so for me, it's around knowledge reuse, right? I'm not going to conduct new research to solve this problem. There is no activation. I'm not even there yet, right? But I am working at a line of business, cross business scenario. And from a measurement standpoint, I'm like, what is it that I have to measure? I'm going to start at the beginning. I'm going to take a uh, stock of research output. What, what's actually out there across this thousands plus organization? And I'm going to figure out, OK, here are all the different research reports, whether it's from games user research or not is irrelevant. But here are all the sources that we have. And I start building a strategy around, a, OK, I need to show value to the LT, the fact that they asked me to solve this for them in a proactive one-off way. I'm not bold enough to say, I'm going to change the way that gaming at Microsoft is developed. And I'm going to tell Phil Spencer what's up. Like, I'm not, not going to do that. I'm going to try and take this request and figure out in a one-off scenario, once I look across this, this world, through knowledge curation and synthesis, can we add value? So I've built a hypothesis. This helped me build a hypothesis that states, if we can bring together various sources of research that's happening across the organization in the spirit of voice of the customer, that we will make the organization smarter if the topic is relevant to the LT with conducting zero extra effort. No new research is going to be conducted. That was the hypothesis that I built. So, I'm going to take a round. We're going to pick a topic that's important to the LT. I'm going to do outreach to different kind of organizations and say, let's bring together an analysis of phenomenon X. And let's show the business that we can give them a, a set of insights that they otherwise wouldn't have had if we didn't bring all these things together. In a perfect world, something actually happens from it. But as I think through each one of these scenarios, I'll selectively pick and choose which is the one that I want to blow out and which is the one that I'm just going to stay at. Because sometimes the cycle for me, it will be over the course of years. But what, in this case, what this turned into is like, I need to build a knowledge work tool product. I need to productize these insights. And so now we have a product called Consolidated Gaming Insights at Microsoft. And we have a bunch of phases that we're going through. It's first focusing on KPIs and the official metrics where everyone can find uh, the data in one place. But it also is providing the ability for customization for Power BI reports and things like that that we can house so people can do their, an, their analysis that they need to do, but it is in one place. And we're also partnering with engineering teams to start building the APIs to scrape the research database for people to search our stuff, to scrape the analytics database from the market research so there's a place to find their stuff, to build the engineering capabilities, to drop all of the syndicated research that we may be buying in one place and can scrape it. Now, we have a lot of work to do around the UX of what this looks like and what it feels like, but we're on our way, right? 
And so that's just one example of how this cycle has helped me think through a very sticky and ambiguous problem. It works at all levels. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, I have 15 minutes, but I wanted to leave some uh, room for some questions. We kind of went back a couple decades to the fun phase of exploration of who are we, what are we doing, and, and tons of rejection. And I know a lot of you that were there uh, that time and even after that experienced similar, similar fun conversations. But then as a discipline, we moved into this era of awareness. There was a lot of hard work by a lot of people in this room and, and outside of the room that took the time to show up at a GDC, to do the usability tutorials, to write their articles on Gama Sutra, to write the academic book chapters, and so on and so on. We did a lot of work to try and just get a general awareness of what it was that we did. And we had help with mass media along the way to spread the word. And with that comes a legitimacy, which moves us into where we are now. We're relevant and we're influential. So we covered a lot of ground. But if there's kind of one thing that I want you to, to take away from today's talk, it's to recognize this. Remember, celebrate that we started here and we did succeed in creating a discipline. We did succeed in changing an industry. And that is something to be proud of. But it also anchors around what we do. The next phase, the next quest is the why, which I believe is to enable the magic of gaming for every person on the planet. Thank you. So we still have 10 minutes. Okay, so 10-ish, 10 10-plus-ish 10 minutes for, uh, for questions from folks and I get to selectively decide if I answer it or not, because there's hecklers in the audience. James, uh, <clears throat> Tony has the mic. All right, great talk, Randy, no surprise there. But I have a hard question for you. So you're talking about building a knowledge database that your partners and stuff can use. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could speak a bit to your thoughts around your concerns around that perhaps being misused or data being taken out of context. I'm wondering if you can give us some advice there. <clears throat> yes. Um, you know, I went through my own, uh, everyone heard the question, okay, because it was Mike, right? Um, I kind of had to go through my own evolution or playing the whack-a-mole game, where I used to be very precious about research insights. I used to be really precious about data, because I assumed everyone was stupid, and that would, they would do the wrong thing with it. But in a world where, in a, where there's a culture that we're trying to drive people forward to truly being customer obsessed, we have to let them use and have access and explore and guide and consume as much information as possible and trust that, we, and that they have the best intent at hand, right? So there's a little bit of a shift in what we do to becoming a facilitator of insights, and that's why process is so important. We don't want to be a lock, a, you know, a gating mechanism. What we want to do is guide our partners who aren't used to seeing data and start influencing the process and when it shows up and how it shows up. So it's a bit out there, but that, from a philosophical standpoint, that's kind of how I navigate the space. It's, yes, let's open it all up. Let's all be transparent, and then let me guide you for how best to maximize the use of particular kinds of data and when. Another question? Yep, over here, Mike. <clears throat> so what are some of the lessons that you learned going from that kind of initial stage, getting to the acceptance, that you think will be most relevant in moving towards this 2.0 phase, you know, as we're trying to move towards these, you know, change in industry again and getting that kind of buy-in for this wider mm -hmm. uh, quest, what are some of the most yeah. helpful things that you learned that will lead for that? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question, and I, and I think I have a simple answer. At the core of what we do, is uh, as games researchers or games UXers or whatever the hell you want to call it, at the core of what we do is an ability to take abstract things right, 
and make them concrete and useful. Right? If you have a background in HCI, that's what you do. If you have a PhD in social psychology, that's what you do. You navigate spaces, you create hypotheses, and then you add value. So if you assume that your superpower is to be able to take something that's abstract and make meaning out of it, <clears throat> find a stakeholder and solve a problem for them, period. It doesn't matter what. It could be with game design, it may not be. It may be you're helping them understand their team culture, it doesn't matter. But take the core skills that we have and start applying it in spaces that you otherwise think aren't that relevant to your day job. It opens doors, it gains momentum, you get exposed to different parts of the business, and then you're now in a world where you can drive different kinds of conversations. The simple act of helping a partner um, navigate some survey results about their team culture because, hey, we can help with that. We, we look at data and we can help you analyze it. Opens up a conversation with the stakeholder around their team and what are their goals and what else are you trying to do? I could help you do that. So add value, solve a problem for someone, don't limit it to something in the game. Uh, you and the peach, because you had your hand up a while. Yeah. Not you, Ben Weber. No, just kidding. No, no, you, you. Yes, please. Hi, I was actually very intrigued by the magical experience. So I wanted to know, could you share some stories about how you create a, sh a shared vision of the magical experience? And um, did you, were you able to track the creation of that magical experience in a way that um, it made sense to business? The magical experience uh, in terms of the the gaming? Yeah. I think it's more, of, um, it's more of a concept and way that I want us to think. Uh, it's because the, the context was, or the point was, the dialogue that we have is so focused on the mechanics of what we do, right? And you, you, you could see the same thing back in the 90s with the HCI community, where the number of panels around debating the sample size, six to eight people for a usability test ad nauseum was the biggest waste of time on the planet. You had a lot of really smart people focusing on that, and I don't want that to happen to us. I don't want us as an organization or as a discipline to, to debate over these little minor things. Now, the quality and rigor of the work we do is important. That is absolutely, sh I don't want to dismiss that, and there's a space for it. But the magical experiences, what I'm trying to convey is this notion of why are we doing what we're trying to do, to focus our sights on something a little bit bigger and more inspirational in hopes that the dialogue starts to change, in hopes that we start trying to figure out at a practical level, how do you measure that? Right? How do you measure magical? Right? And I also want us to be inspired to, under, to make sure that we all got in the industry for the most part because we, we love video games, right? And video games are cool. But I, I want us to recognize that the act of play is so fundamental to being human. And we, because we are influential and because gaming is such a cultural force, have a responsibility to help move that forward and make it available to as many people as possible. So it's as much an inspirational concept as anything else. And I don't have a good, like, this is how um, I've quantified it and got my VPs to agree. I, I don't have that for you. Thank you. So, yeah. Other uh, questions? Ben? Yeah. Great talk, Randy. Uh, in the analytics space, GDPR has been really significant in terms of pretty much everything we do. So All spaces. That's yeah. what I was going to ask, which is really what kind of privacy concerns with additional regulations and just other concerns around privacy does this discipline of user research need to take note of moving forward? Yeah, I mean, GDPR and the privacy, as you know, I mean, um, we... It's something that is having to change the, the, the more on a logistics process and awareness, but it, it's less, I don't think it changes kind of the motivations behind why we're doing what we're doing. I do think it is, it's one of those just necessary taxes that you need to make sure that you're partnering with the right folks in your organization and that you're compliant and that the things that we have control over is what we do with the data that we have access to. We're not going to have control over, you know, what's PII, what's not PII. What are we allowed to store, and how long are we allowed to store it? Those things 
for the most part, are going to come down from some legal person, and we just have to do it. But of the things that we can control, do we feel like we are doing the right thing in the spirit of privacy? Are we making sure <clears throat> that we're putting things in place that we own that enables people to trust what we're doing? So it's as much as hire a, hire a PM, make them figure out what all the <laughs> logistics are, and then you, Ben, as a leader, set the tone for how you and your team and your colleagues uh, approach data so that you, you feel good that you are doing the right thing in the spirit of, of the GDPR compliance. Um, how much time we have? Like, we got five minutes. Yeah, yep, in front. Hi, great talk. Thanks. Um, my question is, do you have any tips on knowledge distribution? Because what I encountered often is that with a background in HCI or something, a lot of the things, you, I think you call it silly mistakes, happen. Uh, you see them happen in UI and mm -hmm. But if there's a team of very junior game designers yeah. or engineers <coughs> that are not endemic to this, how do you teach them like the crash course quickly of this is all existing knowledge, you, we, should, we should focus on important stuff? Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's two, I have two answers to that, right? And if I were to be um, kind of clinical about it and, and use <laughs> walk the walk a bit, um, there's an inform and engage stage that you need to figure out with that set of junior designers, how do they consume information? Right? Because someone who's super experienced in the industry, um, well, actually, any creative, right? They're going to consume information and utilize it differently. And so it's going to be a custom answer, right? You just got to get in there and say, hey, how do you, what is your development process? What does it look like? Um, walk me through it. And then from there, you can kind of figure out, is there an opportunity to try and drive some of the insights in there? Because if you show up with a bunch of best practice dots, they're not going to read it. Right. Um, the other answer is at the high end is the knowledge work tools, right? Where we have the and I recommend going to is it UI Traps, Todd Kelly, UI Traps dot com. Yes. So at Michael Medlock and Steve Herps, uh, researchers at Microsoft a while ago, developed a UI tenants and traps um, approach, which you can do org level training for how to um, identify usability problems and things like that. And in, within Microsoft, we've been pretty successful at doing org level trainings of it and you hand them a set of cards and then they use it and, and they seem to like it because there's, there's actually an object they can look at. Um, and that's kind of the other, the other end of it. But go to uitraps.com and you can kind of see what that, what that looks like. Uh, any other questions? I want to look in the back since I've been up front back there. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, how would you create an awesome knowledge share database without an army of engineers? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, that that's a longer that's a longer conversation. Um, how do we create an knowledge? I mean, there is going to be different levels of it, right? Do you even have a way to know what research was done? Like, can you? find that report from three years ago. Like, it's going to be a graded, you know, a continuation, right, of, an, of investment. But if thinking ahead and being able to put meta tags in your, you know, in your reports so the search function's easier and things like that, um, I'm sure there are third-party kinds of solutions that you can look at and buy off the shelf for kind of knowledge repository kinds of, um, kinds of things. But at, at minimum, when you think through the workflow and the work that you're doing, it always seems like a tax to do any type of archiving, because you got to just get the results to the designers and move on to the next thing. Take the time to think through the archiving of where it's stored and how you're going to access it later. Always ask yourself, if I need to find this in a year, how would I do it? And then just kind of go from there. And it could literally just be a file sharing, being more organized and disciplined about where you drop your stuff to, as, a, as a start. Uh, another question. Did you have one? I did. Yeah. yeah. I think we have like two minutes. So we'll take. Uh, we'll, let's try and do two more questions, and then we'll. So recognizing that a lot of us, you know, operate under a business model, how do you like navigate the dilemma that might be posed, like whenever the research that you find doesn't match like the expectations of like a stakeholder 
or I mean, I'm, I'm not industry. So I assume that whenever they come to you, they have something in mind that they'd like to see or like to find. Um, yeah. And so are there like some ethical dilemmas that you like experience like when you find? Yeah, them? I mean, um, you know, our job is to, to be as objective as possible. And if you're in the fortunate position to have influence over something like a, a reporting or org structure, that's one way you can handle it. Like with Microsoft, we take pride in being a centralized team, but we embed our folks into the partners. And the fact that they're centralized means there's no threat of management hierarchy because they don't report up through them. And so then it's just a cultural thing. But um, in general, like at a low level for tips and tricks, you never want to surprise someone's boss with something. But you always want to understand what it is they want to know and, and just tell it like it is. Because that, that's the, the root of the value of what we bring. It's not to validate. It's not to make friends, even though making friends is a good thing. It's, it's really to be a representative of the customer in the truest form that, that we can. Uh, let's take one more, and then we'll, we'll, we'll kill it. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kelly. I'm one of the team leads at Ubisoft Montreal. Um, one of the things that I've encountered in the team is when, you know, this, this kind of message that we try to push around being embedded and um, empowering um, the external parts of our team to take on the insight that we've learned and that kind of stuff. But there are those dark days where that's really difficult and the team can get really demotivated and yeah. can feel like their impact is so low. Yeah. How do you reinvigorate your team to remind them of the message that you've shared with us today? <coughs> You know, that, that's, a, that's a tough one, and, and I would, I'd love to talk to you for like an hour about it. Um, from a structure standpoint, being in a centralized org, the, recognizing that as a researcher, you're set up to be an outsider, culturally, socially. They're going to shut the door on you at the all hands. They're going to leave you off of the team, even though you're, you're part of the product team. Right? So one of the ways over time that we've tried to battle this is to make sure that everyone on our team has a strong identity of who they are and where they belong and what they stand for. Right? We have a brand. We are Xbox Research. We have had different names throughout the years. But there's a strong legacy and brand of people on my team that when they do get shut out or they don't feel bad, they do know where they belong. They do know and they could subscribe to a bigger power, right? Um, and they have a home because there's always gonna be times when teams will shut the door and you just not listen. And if you're lost in limbo, that's when real problems happen. But if you have a place to go back to and you have a brand and you have an identity, um, that helps kind of reinvigorate, just the nature of having a culture of a team that you belong to. And it's a weird thing to do, right? Because we have folks that are part of uh, Xbox Research, but we have p this, that same individual is part of the Minecraft team or part of the Halo team. But it's really important for us to make sure that they know what their identity is to kind of reinforce when the times get tough. But we are out of time. Um, but I just want to thank everybody and have a great conference. <laughs>